A very good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IS Academy. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 15th of June 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we will be discussing today. You can go through it. At the end of the video we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So try to watch the entire video and a kind request to you all those who haven't yet subscribe our YouTube channel do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notifications regarding our current affairs videos. Now let us get into our first news article discussion. Look at this news article here it says that the Tamil Nadu government has decided to withdraw its general consent given to the CBI. This means that the CBI will now need prior permission from the Tamil Nadu government before it can investigate cases in the state. See this move came on the same day when a minister from Tamil Nadu was arrested by the enforcement directorate. See in the past several other states have also withdrawn their general consent given to the CBI. And this is about the news article given here. Now in this discussion we will try to understand about this withdrawal of general consent. See the CBI is a special investigative agency in India. However, it needs permission from state governments to investigate crimes in their respective states. This permission is required under the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act of 1946. Know that section 6 of the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act is titled Consent of State Government to Exercise of Powers and Jurisdiction. The section 6 highlights that the CBA cannot exercise its powers and jurisdiction in any area of the state without the consent of the respective state government. This means that the CBA needs prior permission from the state government to carry out investigations within the state's jurisdiction. Now coming to the consent, see the consent given by state governments can be of two types which include case specific consent and general consent. Here case specific content means that the CBA needs to seek permission for each individual case it wants to investigate. On the other hand, general consent allows the CBA to conduct investigations smoothly within a state without seeking permission for each case. Okay, this is about two types of consent. Now what happens if states withdraw this general consent? As we saw just now, many states including Tamil Nadu have started withdrawing their general consent to the CBA. This means that the CBA can no longer register new cases involving central government officials or private individuals in those states without obtaining prior permission from the state government. It is also important to note that cases registered by the CBA prior to the withdrawal of general consent can still be investigated. But going forward the CBA will need to apply for consent for each new case in those states. However, there is a recent order from the Calcutta High Court that provides some scope to the CBI. The Calcutta High Court ruled that the CBI cannot be stopped from investigating a central government employee in another state even if the state has withdrawn their general consent. The Calcutta High Court emphasized that corruption cases should be treated equally across the country and the central government employees cannot be exempt from investigation just because their offices are located in states that have withdrawn their general consent. Okay, as per Calcutta High Court judgment, the CBA can still investigate cases that involves central government employee in the state that have withdrawn their general consent. Also note that this Calcutta High Court order has been challenged in the Supreme Court and the final decision is pending. Until then, the CBA can use the Calcutta High Court order and continue certain investigations until the Supreme Court provides its ruling. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. In the discussion, we saw about the general consent that is given to the CBA. Now, with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now, look at this editorial here. See, the 16th Finance Commission is likely to be constituted in upcoming November. So, this editorial article explains the issues and challenges that lies before the 16th Finance Commission. The author speaks about the issues in horizontal distribution of funds, then about the impact of cess and surcharges on financial devolution to the states and finally about rationalization of freebies. Now in this discussion we will understand the points provided in this editorial article. Now before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here you can go through it. Now first we will look at some basics about finance commission. See article 280 of the Indian constitution provides for finance commission. 
so we can say that finance commission is a constitutional body the finance commission consists of a chairman and four other members and all of them are appointed by the president know that finance commission is not a permanent body the president constitutes a finance commission once in every 5 years the president of india specifies the tenure of the members of finance commission generally the members are appointed for a duration of 5 years the main function of the finance commission is to give suggestions on sharing of finance between the center and the states and once the report is submitted to the president the particular finance commission ceases to exist till date 15 finance commissions were constituted and as i said earlier the 16th finance commission will be constituted in the upcoming november okay this is a basic information about finance commission now we will understand the points given in this editorial now firstly we will look at the issues surrounding horizontal distribution of funds know that the finance commission will determine the sharing of tax revenue between the center and the states that is the vertical distribution of funds apart from this the finance commission also determine the sharing of amount among the states that is the horizontal distribution of funds now if you look at the pre reform period that is before 1991 the recommendations of the finance commission was not criticized widely this is because if there was any financial burden in the state the center government had many other means to compensate the states the center compensated the states through financial planning and public sector undertaking investments but after the 1991 economic reforms the fresh public sector undertaking investments have reduced drastically and the planning commission was also abolished in 2014 so as of now the finance commission is the only architect of india's fiscal federalism that decides upon the finance share between center and the states in this current scenario the decisions of finance commission will have a greater impact and it has a greater responsibility of determining the sharing of tax revenue between the center and the states see as per the 15th finance commission recommendations the center has to share 41 percentage of its tax pool to the states that is if the center gets rupees 100 as tax means it needs to share rupees 41 to the states and this is called vertical distribution note that the states cannot demand for increasing the cap on vertical distribution of funds this is because the 15th finance commission report are binding on the center and the states therefore the states are continuously raising the concerns over horizontal distribution formula that is the distribution of tax amount among the states now how horizontal distribution is done first of all know that horizontal distribution refers to allocation of funds to each state from the 41 percentage tax pool the horizontal distribution refers to the methodology that is used to determine the share of funds from 41 percentage tax pool for each state see there are six parameters used in the calculation of horizontal devolution or horizontal distribution of funds this include income distance area then population based on 2011 census demographic performance forest and ecology and tax and fiscal efforts so based on these six parameters only the horizontal distribution of funds is carried out now let us look at the issues in horizontal devolution see the 15th finance commission used 2011 population figures for determining the share of states but before 15th finance commission there is standard practice of using 1971 population figures in the estimation of share of the states the 15th finance commission gave 15 percentage weightage to 2011 population in the calculation of horizontal devolution of funds see when we compare the population of 2011 with that of 1971 many states have stabilized their population by taking many initiatives so as per 15th finance commission recommendations the states which worked well in stabilizing their population rates will get lesser amounts particularly the southern states will be most affected as they stabilized their population so such states call the 15th finance commission recommendations as a penalty for the good performance therefore the population figure is one issue regarding horizontal devolution The next issue which may arise in horizontal devolution will be in revenue deficit grants. See the revenue deficit grants are provided by the finance commission to the states which has current account deficit even after getting the tax share from the center. The idea behind such a grant is to ensure that every state should be able to provide a minimum level of service to its residents. See the revenue deficit grants are likely to be an incentive to states which are not performing good fiscally. therefore the states with high revenue deficit may not focus on reducing the deficit as they are compensated by the finance commission 
and this is where issue arises see there is a notion that southern states are performing good in infrastructure private investment social indicators and rule of law this resulted in prosperity of southern states and it widened the north south gap now coming to horizontal distribution the very nature of horizontal distribution is that the rich states compensate the poorer states therefore some rich states views that the horizontal distribution formula is inefficient and unfair so based on these observations the author suggests that the 16th finance commission should derive fairest horizontal distribution formula that would benefit both rich and poor states and it would lessen the north south gap okay this is all about the issues regarding horizontal distribution of funds now moving on to see about the issues surrounding cess and surcharges see in recent times the center is increasing cess and surcharges rather than increasing the taxes see if there is a rise in tax then the value of tax pool will also increase which will ultimately result in increased share to the states but when it comes to cess and surcharge the center government need not share it with the states so if the center raises cess and surcharges the center will get more money and it need not be shared with the states because of this many states accuse the center government that by increasing the cess and surcharge the states are not getting their legitimate share from the national tax revenue for example a white paper report by tamil nadu government pointed out that the proportion of cess and surcharges in center's tax revenue had doubled from 10.4 percentage in 2011 12 to 20.2 percentage in 2019 to 20 therefore the author of the editorial suggests that the next finance commission that is the 16th finance commission should lay down guidelines for levying the cess and surcharge and the finance commission should also suggest a formula to cap the amount that can be raised through cess and surcharge okay this is all about the issues surrounding cess and surcharge now finally let us understand the issues regarding freebies given by the state governments see on one side the freebies are good and it is very much useful to poor people but considering the fiscal condition of india we have to reconsider the freebies culture see the frbm act which is enacted to control the deficit has made a check on such populist freebies measures but the state governments uses other means to increase the debt without appearing in the budget books moreover any checks on such freebies may be viewed as a challenge to the sovereignty of the elected governments therefore the author suggests that the next finance commission should lay down guidelines on the spending of freebies okay and that's all regarding this discussion this discussion we saw about the basics about finance commission then we saw about the issues that lies before the 16th finance commission which is going to be constituted this november now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this text and context article this article talks about transgenic crops in india suddenly it is in news because a new kind of transgenic cotton seed approved by the center's genetic engineering appraisal committee see this new kind of seed contains a gene called cri2 ai the purpose of this gene is to make cotton resistant to pink ballworm which is a major pest but three states namely gujarat maharashtra and telangana have opposed the testing of this new kind of transgenic cotton seeds okay this is about the news now in this context let us understand few important points mentioned in this text and context article now before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here you can go through it now first we will understand about transgenic technology see transgenic refers to an organism or cell whose genome has been altered by the introduction of one or more foreign dna sequences from another species by artificial means the transgenic organisms are generated in the laboratory for research purposes similarly gm crops or transgenic crops are also generated in laboratory and after testing they are made commercially available but to be commercially available the crops should be finally approved by the genetic engineering appraisal committee that is geac now we shall look into the approval process see gm crops are strictly regulated to control threats to animal health human safety and biodiversity during the development cultivation and transboundary movement of gm crops the rules and policies that regulate gm crops in india include the rules 1989 under environment protection act 1986 then seed policy 2002 then the guidelines include recombinant dna guidelines 1990 and guidelines for research in transgenic crops 1998 now talking broadly the rules cover all activities related to 
research and development of gm crops including field and clinical trials of gm crops then deliberate or unintentional use of gm crops and finally the import export and manufacture of gm crops now look at this table here in this table the role of each ministry in gm crops is given here you can go through it now coming back to the rules and policies see among the rules and policies rules 1989 under environmental protection act 1986 is the most important one the name of the rules of 1989 is rules for manufacture use import export and storage of hazardous microorganisms or genetically engineered organisms or cells 1989 this rules of 1989 define six competent authorities they include recombinant dna advisory committee review committee on genetic manipulation genetic engineering approval committee industrial biosafety committees state biosafety coordination committees and district level committees see these six committees are tasked with handling various aspects of 1989 rules see among these six authorities only three authorities are involved in approval of new transgenic crops they include institutional biosafety committees review committee on genetic manipulation and genetic engineering approval committee while institutional biosafety committees is set up at each institution for monitoring institute level research in genetically modified organisms then review committee on genetic manipulation is set up at department of biotechnology to monitor ongoing research activities in genetically modified organisms and small scale field trials on the other hand the genetic engineering approval committee is responsible for granting permits to conduct experimental and large scale open field trials and also grant approval for commercial release of gm crops okay so according to the rules of 1989 the top biotech regulator in india is genetic engineering appraisal committee this committee functions as a statutory body under the ministry of environment and forests see the genetic engineering appraisal committee is earlier known as genetic engineering approval committee okay i hope now you have got an idea about how a new transgenic crop is approved also remember not all crops generated in laboratory are approved for commercial usage after testing a transgenic plant can apply for commercial clearance only after it has proven to be demonstrably better than comparable non gm variants on claimed parameters like drought tolerance or insect resistance apart from this the gm crops should also not pose any ecological harm to other species that may be being cultivated in the vicinity even after proving this open field trials will be taking place often over multiple crop seasons and types of geographical conditions to assess its suitability across different states here comes the issue now before looking into the issue that the article talks about we will see the status of transgenic crops in india see the first generation gm crops had improved traits like herbicide resistant crops like soya beans and maize and pest resistant crops like cotton and corn the second generation gm crops involved enhanced quality traits like higher nutrient content for example golden rice which is one of the very first gm crops is biofortified to address vitamin a deficiency later in march 2002 bt cotton was approved by government of india as the first transgenic crop for commercial cultivation for a period of 3 years apart from cotton there are more than 20 crops under research and development in about 50 public and private sector organizations in india out of these 13 crops have been approved for contained limit field trials in india and very recently the genetic engineering appraisal committee approved the environmental release of mustard hybrid dmh11 for seed production and testing and this is one step away from full commercial cultivation currently the cry to ai seeds has passed preliminary confined trials and it was recommended by the geac to be tested in farmers fields at telangana maharashtra gujarat and haryana since agriculture is a state subject the companies interested in testing their seeds needs approvals from the states for conducting such tests but only haryana have given permission for such tests and other states are opposing it following the response the geac has asked the department of biotechnology and the icar to jointly organize capacity building activities to inform the state or union territory governments regarding the technology involved see the article does not stop there it even suggests an alternative solution to the issue see to resolve this issue the geac can declare some regions across india as 
notified testing sites and there are 42 such proposed sites and if they get approval the companies that wants to conduct trials of gm crops won't need the permission of states for such trials okay so these are some of the takeaway points mentioned in the news article now let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here it says that the indian government has decided to stop selling rice and wheat from the central pool to the state governments see the selling is usually done under the open market sales scheme that is omss now this move by the central government will impact states like karnataka which provide free grains to the poor however the sale of rice under omss will continue for northeastern hilly and crisis affected states at the existing rate also food corporation of india may sell rice to private parties to moderate market prices okay this is about the news now in this context let us learn about the open market sales scheme see the open market sales scheme which is in short called as omss is made by the government to deal with extra food grains that they have so basically fca that is the food corporation of india releases wheat and rice at predetermined prices in the open market from time to time under omss scheme see the government sells the extra food grains to prevent them from going bad and also to save money on storage the government does this by using e auctions and other methods to sell the grains so from this way the people who need the grains can buy them at fairer prices see the main goal of open market sales scheme is to keep prices stable in the market also oms scheme aims to enhance supply of grains especially during the lean season thereby we can moderate the general open market prices especially in the deficit regions see the government wants to make sure that there is enough food for everyone and also that the prices stay reasonable it's like making sure there is good balance of supply and demand see presently fca is undertaking sale of wheat and raw rice grade a to bulk consumers or private traders through e auction also the state governments and union territory administrations are also allowed to participate in the e auction if they require wheat and rice note that the minimum and maximum quantity of wheat for one buyer shall be 50 metric ton and 5000 metric ton respectively and the maximum quantity for state government agencies in one tender is 40000 metric ton also the minimum and maximum quantity of raw rice grade a is 50 metric ton and 3500 metric ton respectively the maximum quantity of rice that a state government can bid in a single e auction is 25000 metric ton okay this is a basic information about open market sales scheme see there are some benefits to this oms scheme one important benefit is that it reduces wastage see instead of letting the extra food grains go to waste they are used for people to eat so the oms scheme helps to fight food insecurity in the country then the another benefit is that the government can make money from selling the extra food grains and the money got from the selling can be used for other important things like helping people in need or building schools and also by selling the extra stock the government can also save money on carrying costs these costs include things like storing maintaining the food grains etc so selling the extra stock reduces these unwanted expenses so this is all about the benefits associated with oms scheme but there are some challenges as well see one challenge of the oms is that it may affect the income of farmers see when there is a lot of grain being sold in the market the prices may go down this can make it harder for farmers to earn enough money from selling their crops then the another challenge is ensuring the quality of the extra food grains sometimes the grains may not meet the required standards which can lead to spoilage and waste lastly the process of selling the grains can be complicated and take time it involves things like e auctions which can be a bit tricky to manage so this can cause delays and administrative issues to sum it up the open market sales scheme is a way for the government to sell extra food grains in the open market it helps to prevent wastage then to generate revenue and to stabilize prices however the scheme can also impact farmers and it requires careful management and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the open market sales scheme and we saw about the benefits and challenges associated with open market sales scheme see this topic is very much useful for your prelims and mains preparation so make note of each and every points that we discussed now let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here it says that 
the 22nd law commission of india has invited suggestions from different groups regarding the uniform civil code see the suggestions are invited from different groups including the public and religious organizations see the previous commission has also examined this issue and received numerous responses now the 22nd law commission wants to discuss uniform civil code again the panel emphasizes that a unified nation does not require complete uniformity but efforts should be made to balance our diversity with universally accepted human rights principles and this is about the news article given here now in this context let us use this opportunity to learn about law commission see the law commission of india is a body established by the government of india to ensure that laws in the country are fair and just the law commission advises the ministry of law and justice and it works towards the proper implementation of laws note that the law commission of india is not defined in the indian constitution but the law commission is created as a part of article 39a the article 39a aims to promote equal opportunity for justice and provide free legal assistance to those who cannot afford it and also note that the law commission is a non statutory body that is there is no act that gives power to law commission now talking about the composition of law commission see the law commission has one chairperson and besides him there are four other members which includes a member secretary and they all are referred to as full time members then there also can be up to five part time members note that a retired supreme court judge or chief justice of any high court heads the law commission note that the law commission has been active since pre independence times the first commission was established in 1834 under the british rule it was established by the charter act of 1833 and was chaired by lord macaulay the first law commission of independent india was established in 1955 and since then there have been 22 commissions now how law commission is formed see the government creates a new law commission by passing a resolution and obtaining the president's assent then the chairperson is chosen by the central government the 21st law commission of india had a tenure from 2015 to 18 and it was the last commission and now after four long years the 22nd law commission of india was formed okay now we will understand some important recommendations made by law commission See the important one is the abolition of death penalty for all crimes except terrorism and waging war against the state. Then the law commission has also recommended for simultaneous elections for Lok Sabha and state legislative assemblies. Apart from this, it also recommended for the implementation of uniform civil code for all religious communities. In addition to this, the law commission has also recommended reforms in the criminal justice system such as the introduction of fast track courts. This is to address the backlog of pending cases and the use of technology for efficient and fair trials. Overall, the Law Commission of India plays a crucial role in reviewing and suggesting reforms to the legal system to promote justice and to ensure equal access to the law for all citizens. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the Law Commission. Then we saw about the composition of Law Commission. Then we saw about the formation of Law Commission. and finally we saw some points about the recommendations made by previous law commissions now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here this news article reports about the ongoing issue between the sahara india life insurance corporation and the insurance regulatory and development authority of india that is irdai see earlier irdai had ordered the transfer of life insurance business of sahara india life insurance corporation to the sbi life insurance company this is because the financial position of sahara india life insurance corporation had been deteriorating and it is facing heavy losses so because of the order of irdai the sahara group entity had taken this issue to securities appellate tribunal in response to this the security appellate tribunal has given a stay to the order passed by irdai This is about the news given here now in this context let us learn about IRDAI see IRDAI stands for Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority of India note that IRDAI is a statutory body see statutory bodies are nothing but the bodies which are formed by an act of parliament IRDAI is formed under the Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority Act 1999 so because of this only IRDAI is a statutory body See, the IRDA is responsible for the overall supervision and development of insurance sector in India. 
and note that the head office of IRDAI is based in Hyderabad. Now moving on to see about the objectives of IRDAI. The main objectives of IRDAI include protecting the interest of the policyholders, speedy and orderly growth of insurance industry, then speedy settlement of genuine claims, then effective grievance redressal mechanism and finally ensuring the financial security of insurance market. This is all about the objectives of IRDAI. Now we will look at the composition of IRDAI. See the section 4 of IRDAI Act specifies the composition of IRDAI. IRDAI is a 10 member team appointed by the government of India. It consists of a chairman, 5 whole time members and 4 part time members. Okay, this is all about the composition. Now talking about the entities that are regulated by IRDAI. See the entities that are regulated by IRDAI includes life insurance companies, general insurance companies, reinsurance companies, agency channel and intermediaries which include corporate agents, brokers, third party administrators, surveyors and loss assessors. Okay, this is about the entities that are regulated by IRDAI. Now we will look at the powers and functions of IRDAI. See the powers and functions are clearly laid down in IRDA Act 1999. Section 14 of IRDA Act specifies the duties and functions of IRDAI. As per the section 14, the three main functions of IRDAI include certifying the insurance companies, secondly protecting the interest of policyholders and finally adjudication of disputes. Some of its other functions include promoting efficiency in the conduct of insurance business, then regulation of the investments of funds by insurance companies, then adjudication of disputes between insurers and intermediaries or insurance intermediaries and finally exercising such other functions as may be prescribed by the government. Okay, this is all about the functions and powers of IRDAI. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion is about the formation of IRDAI. Then we moved on to see about the objectives of IRDAI. Then we saw about the composition of IRDAI. And finally we saw some points about the powers and functions of IRDAI. Now with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions. Now look at the first question. This question is regarding CBI that is the Central Bureau of Investigation. Here three statements are given and we have to find how many of the statements are correct. Now look at the first statement. CBI comes under the control of Ministry of Personal Public Grievances and Pensions. See this statement is correct. The CBI comes under the control of Department of Personal and Training in the Ministry of personal public grievances and pension. So statement 1 is correct. Now coming to the second statement, cases registered by the CBI prior to the withdrawal of general consent by a state can still be investigated. See this statement is correct as we saw in the discussion. The case registered by the CBI prior to the withdrawal can still be investigated by CBI. So statement 2 is correct. Now coming to the third statement, CBI has supervisory functions over Central Vigilance Commission. See this statement is incorrect. Actually, the Central Vigilance Commission has supervisory powers over CBI and not vice versa. So third statement is incorrect. Since only two statements are correct, the correct answer for the question is option B, two only. Moving on, let's take up the second question. This question is regarding Law Commission of India. Look at the first statement. The first Law Commission resulted in the codification of both Penal Code and the Criminal Procedure Code. See this statement is correct. The first law commission codified both penal code and criminal procedure code. Also know that the first four law commissions were responsible for the development and formulation of key legal statutes in India. This includes the Indian Code of Civil Procedure, the Indian Contract Act, the Indian Evidence Act and the Transfer of Property Act. Once again statement one is correct. Now coming to the second statement, 10 law commissions were constituted during the British era. See this statement is incorrect. Only four commissions were formed during the British era. Under the Charter Act of 1833, the first law commission was formed in 1834 and it was headed by Lord Macaulay. Subsequently, the second, third and fourth law commissions were established in 1853, 1861 and 1879 respectively. So during the British era, only four law commissions were formed. Therefore, second statement is incorrect. Now coming to the third statement, the first law commission in independent India was chaired by Mr. M. C. Satalwad. See this statement is correct. The first law commission in independent India was chaired by Mr. M. C. Satalwad. He was the attorney general of India during that time. So third statement is correct. 
Now coming to the fourth statement, the recommendations of the commission are not binding on the government. See this statement is correct. Law commission is only an advisory body and the recommendations of law commission are not binding on the government. So fourth statement is correct. The question asks for the correct statements. From the given four statements, statement two alone is incorrect and the remaining three statements are correct. So the correct answer is option C three only. Moving on, let's take up the final question. See this is a statement based question. This question is about open market sales scheme. Here two statements are given. We have to find whether either of the statement is correct or not and we also have to verify whether second statement is correct explanation of statement one or not. Look at the first statement in the open market sales scheme. The government sells excess stock of food grains in the open market. See this statement is correct. The open market sales scheme involves the government selling excess stock of food and grains in the open market. And this is done to prevent wastage and to make effective use of the food grains. Now coming to the second statement, the state governments are allowed to bid in the e-auction. As you saw in the discussion, this is also correct. Under the open market sales scheme, the state governments and union territory administrations are allowed to bid in the e-auction. So from this we can say that both statements are correct. But whether the second statement is the correct explanation of statement one? See to answer such question, I will tell you a trick. At the end of the statement one, add the word because and continue to read the statement two. Now see if it makes any sense in this question. In the open market sales scheme, the government sells excess stock of food grains in the open market because the state governments are allowed to bid in the e-auction. Does it make sense? Actually no. Therefore, the second statement is not the correct explanation of statement one. So the correct answer is option B. Both statement one and statement two are correct and statement two is not the correct explanation for statement one. Okay. And note that to use this trick, you should first know if the two statements are true or not. If you find the two statements are correct, then you can apply a trick. Now moving on. And this is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in a community section. Try to answer it. And don't worry, the answer for the quiz question is posted in the comment section of the quiz question itself. You can verify it. And displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis, please like, comment and share. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar Ayas Academy YouTube channel. Now, thank you for listening.